America. Uh, I hear from Iowans all the time about the difficulty of recruiting people to be on the police forces, even in our good state of Iowa. What do you think you get when you talk to, for months and months about defunding police? You demoralize the police. You, uh, you have difficulties recruiting. You don't get the proactive uh, policing that we need. So I think we need to start thinking about thanking our police, uh, funding the police properly, encourage proactive policing. And prosecutors, I know you have to have uh, prosecutorial discretion, but you shouldn't be stupid enough to tell people ahead of time what crimes you're going to commit and not commit. Because when you tell that, you tell the criminal elements of America, go ahead and steal 950 dollars worth of goods out of San Francisco's retail stores because you aren't going to be prosecuted. And so what do you expect when you tell people that what laws you're going to enforce or not enforce? You're going to, what you expect is what we're getting, more crime. It's about time that we do what government's supposed to do. We all expect government, we all pay taxes to government to protect the American people, just like the number one responsibility of the federal government is to protect us from foreign uh, enemies. Uh, that's the, the number one responsibility of local government is to protect the people of this country. Well, I noticed this morning um, the uh, latest Politico morning consult poll said that 68% of voters, they think, think that increasing funding for police departments would lower crime rates. Now, you may tell me that's just common sense, and it is common sense, but obviously it's not all that common, particularly among the ideologues on the left who believe that defunding the police is the way to go. Now, I concede you've heard less about the defunding argument because the progressives on the left, the Democrats, realize that's a stone-cold loser. The American people don't believe it. The minority communities, which are unfortunately sometimes targeted by criminals and exploited, they understand the importance of having law enforcement there and properly funded. But it's also, as Senator Grassley said, demoralizing on people who would aspire to serve their communities by working in, in law enforcement. These are dangerous jobs. People wake up in the morning, tell their families goodbye, never knowing whether they're going to be able to come home and see them again because of the risk to their lives and their um, and, and their health. So uh, we ought to be doing everything we can to support our men and women in blue, including making sure that they are funded appropriately and given the respect that they deserve. Senator Daines is next. So, a few weeks ago, one of my senior staffers was walking into work. It was broad daylight, just a few blocks away from where we are all standing here at this moment and she was violently assaulted, broad daylight, trying to get to work. As well, we see the crime going on in the, in the bigger cities, the blue cities across our nation, levels of homicides, of violent crime as we've never seen before. I will tell you, as a Montanan, the spike in crime is not limited to the big cities. Just yesterday, I was on the phone with one of our county sheriffs in one of our largest counties in Montana, as well as one of our city police chiefs from one of our largest cities in Montana. Both of them talked about the scourge of meth and how the meth coming into our state is contributing to the violent crimes we're seeing. Homicides, domestic violence, of course, armed robberies and other thefts. We are a northern border state in Montana with a southern border crisis because if you ask those members of law enforcement where these drugs are coming from, they tell you quickly it's coming from the Mexican cartels. The southern border crisis is creating a crime crisis in Montana because of Mexican meth that's flooding across the southern border. The Mexican cartels have command and control on the southern border because of the, the policies of this administration. There are no supply chain interruptions at the moment with Mexican cartel meth. 
It's coming into our state. It's coming into many states. And I thank the members of law enforcement, who I spoke to yesterday, who are doing their very best with a very difficult situation. And both of them said, we've got to start by stopping the flood of meth coming in from Mexico and these Mexican cartels. Senator Kennedy. Well, as my uh, colleagues have pointed out, there's uh, no question that crime has increased in America. Uh, homicides, shootings, armed robbery, carjackings. Um, in many of our cities, um, well, it's, it's safer to walk down the streets of Mogadishu than walk down the streets of those cities. Many of our cities have become the some of the world's largest outdoor shooting ranges. I think it's appropriate to ask why. And I don't mean to, to wax too philosophical here, but I believe in free will. And I think most Americans do as well. I don't agree with everything he said, but I think Sark was right when he said to be is to act. In many respects, all we are is the sum of our actions. And put, a, put another way, it doesn't really matter what's going on in your life or what somebody has done to you. You're responsible for your actions. There are a number of reasons for the increase in our crime rate, but I think part of it is our public leadership. We have many leaders in many of our cities today who believe that, the, that crime, that the, uh, the criminal is the victim. We have many leaders in our communities today who believe deep down that if a criminal commits a crime, it's really not the criminal's fault. It's the fault of an unfair world. Uh, and many of these same people believe that punishment, um, prisons, and cops make it worse. And I do not believe that any free society can order a civilized culture without accepting the concept of free will and responsibility. And until our public leaders in many of our communities give up their motto of see no evil, hear no evil, and prosecute no evil, we're not going to see an improvement. Final point, um, I think President Biden has tolerated a lot of this. Um, an uncharitable person might say that uh, his silence indicates that he's, at least the administration is more interested in Super, goal, go, super Bowl guacamole than the crime rate. And, and the only way, it seems to me, that in America we're going to address this problem is from the top down, bottom up works too, but President Biden needs to address this issue and, uh, and the change in the leadership of some of our public officials. Senator Cruz. Crime is surging across this country. Murder rates are rising, assault rates are rising, carjacking rates are rising. Last year, 12 major American cities broke records, homicide rates. Portland, Indianapolis, Toledo, Rochester, St. Paul, Tucson, Albuquerque, Louisville, Columbus, Baton Rouge, Austin, and Philadelphia. What do those 12 cities have in common? Every single one of them is run by Democrats, all of them. The crime that we are seeing surging across this country is a direct result of Democrats' soft on crime policy. Joe Biden nominated not one, but two of the leading advocates in the country for abolishing the police to senior roles at the U.S. Department of Justice. Every single Senate Democrat voted to confirm two of the leading advocates of abolishing the police to senior positions at the U.S. Department of Justice. When Democrats engage in anti-police rhetoric, when they demonize police officers, it has consequences. 
President Biden nominated Rachel Rollins to be the U.S. Attorney of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Rachel Rollins is one of the many Soros DAs who, as District Attorney in Suffolk County, put out a list of 15 crimes her prosecutors were not allowed to prosecute. When you have soft on crime Democratic DAs that are releasing violent criminals on shockingly low bail, those violent criminals go out and they commit violent crime yet again. And in the face of skyrocketing crime, crime that has women and men across this country deeply, deeply concerned for the safety of their family, the White House press secretary laughs about it. Laughs about what crime? What are you talking about? This administration is so out of touch, they don't understand that when people are getting carjacked, when their homes are threatened, their lives are threatened, that violent crime is real. And when you attack and demonize police officers over and over again, it has a consequence. It is wrong. And I got to say, at any point, Senate Democrats, one Senate Democrat could have stood up and said enough is enough. If one Senate Democrat on the Judiciary Committee had said no, these advocates for abolishing the police would not be senior members of the Department of Justice. If one Senate Democrat on the Judiciary Committee had said no, Rachel Rollins, this incredibly soft on crime Soros DA, who effectively abolished the police by ordering her prosecutors not to prosecute drug crimes, not to prosecute resisting arrest, not to prosecute trespassing. We're seeing in stores across the country looters breaking in, mocking the law because Democrats won't prosecute them. It's not right. It's not fair. And we need to keep people safe. Senator Markson. All right. We got two words for America today. Crack pipes. <clears throat> crack pipes, not crack pots. Did any of us ever think sitting in our senior year in high school at our government class, that we'd be part of a nation where its government gives crack pipes out as, as a tool to, in just a permissive society. I don't think any of us would have ever thought that our socialistic government would do something like that. As I finished up some town halls this past weekend, 15 town halls, I can tell you I've never seen Americans so upset. I've never seen so much fervor. I thought Joe Biden had bottomed out at the end of last year, but I'm telling you, he's still searching for the bottom of his popularity right now. As I listen to my folks at these town halls, I want you to, to listen to what they're telling me. This is what Americans see. Americans see 2 million people, maybe 6 million people cross their border illegally last year. And they see this administration reward them with an all expenses paid vacation trip to any American city of their choosing. America sees riots and vandalism, and this administration applauds them. America sees sh looting and shoplifting, and this administration says don't prosecute. This America saw over five tons of fentanyl cross our border last year. Just imagine five big semi-trucks loaded with a ton of fentanyl. And I remind people, one teaspoon of that fentanyl could kill thousands of people. And like my dad, the police officer said, crime and drug abuse go hand in hand. It's like peanut butter and jelly. The more drug crimes you have, the more crime we're gonna have as well. And then finally, America sees our law enforcement officers being told to turn their back on violent crimes and not pursue. America sees the White House and their par party turn their back on their law enforcement officers. America sees weak-kneed judges and attorneys, prosecuting attorneys. And then, back to our crack pipes. What they're seeing, what Americans are seeing, is insane policy. It's demented policy. It's unthinkable. It's unconscionable. Our president could change all of this if he had the will. Johnson. So you've heard some statistics, uh, record crime rates, record murders, but I don't think we talk enough about the victims and their loved ones. Uh, about a week ago, Jen Psaki, the spokesperson for President Biden, uh, was doing some press event and she was monitoring the different news stations and she 
came across Fox and said, here's Fox. Uh, uh, and one of Fox's uh, news anchors was talking about soft on crime consequences. And then she kind of giggled and said, what does that even mean? Let me tell you what it means. Last week, we held an event here on, on our open border uh, on, uh, about the catch and release on our open border. There, there was a real nice article in uh, Just the News a couple days ago. Let, let, me just, let me just read a couple examples of those consequences that Jen Psaki and apparently this administration is giggling about. In Alabama's Chilton County, two illegal immigrants ages 27 and 28 have been charged in the murders of three adults found shot and burned in an SUV. Another recent case, a Florida father believed he was going to foster parent what he believes a 16-year-old minor from Honduras. That minor was not a minor. That minor killed him. In Florida, a five-year-old five -year girl riding in her mother's car was crushed to death when an illegal immigrant from Honduras crashed into the car. In Harris County, Texas, an illegal immigrant from El Salvador is charged with exiting a vehicle during a routine traffic stop and fatally shooting a sheriff's deputy in the face last month. Last March, 13 immigrants were killed when an SUV driven by their smuggler crashed into a tractor trailer in California. More recently, a 59-year-old mother and her 22-year-old daughter were killed in Texas when their car was T-boned by a speeding vehicle trying to smuggle illegal aliens into the country. Those are the victims. Now, those are the victims of the catch and release, the open border on our southwest border. But we also have catch and release in our criminal justice system. And there's some victims I'd like to talk about that are pretty close to my heart that didn't have to die, that didn't have to have their lives forever altered. And those are the victims of the Waukesha Christmas Parade. They were murdered, not by an SUV CNN, by a murderer who had just run over the mother of his child and was released on a thousand dollars bail so he could murder. And that's what he did. He murdered eight people in Waukesha, injured another 62 during a Christmas parade. You barely hear it on the news anymore. I guess it was the wrong murderer and the wrong victims to have the media pay attention for more than a couple days. But as bad as the victims in terms of the, the people who lost their lives and their loved ones, and the people injured and their lives forever altered, I can't help but think of the little children sitting on the curb expecting to see Santa Claus and instead watching people being slaughtered right in front of them. Can you imagine that? Do you ever think about that? Do you think President Biden does? Do you think these soft on crime DAs and Democrat governed cities think about that? They ought to think about that. So, of course, it's easy to criticize. The question is what the Republicans offer as an alternative. I say we can look at history and see that. There was a theory called the broken windows theory, that if you break a window, it's not a great offense, but by the way, the person that breaks that window is more likely to commit another crime if he gets away with that one. And so they cracked down on the broken windows, by the way, based in social science, and they found dramatically decreasing crime rates in cities across the nation. But now we have an alternative vision in which if you break the window, that will be tolerated. Indeed, we shall classify that not as a crime, not even as something to be arrested for, but rather as something which we just say, tisk tisk, and you go on your way. And what has happened? We've gone from having broken windows to having an escalating cycle of violence. Now, it's not just the people on the streets, but by the way, my colleagues have referenced the DAs in cities like Philadelphia, uh, who have released those picked up on gun crimes 
and that person released goes out and murders another using a gun. Predictably, they are blaming the gun. We should blame the DA who does not keep that person locked up for the gun crime. But it also goes beyond just the micro, if you will. It will also go down to the, if you will, our crime wave being aided and abetted by the lackadaisical approach the administration is taking to the border. We seized 461 pounds of fentanyl at the border. When I go to the border, they tell me they, they seize about a third of that which actually gets through, attempts to get through. So more than that is attempted to get through, uh, has, has gotten through. 461 pounds could kill 104 Americans. Everybody watching this knows or knows of somebody who's died of an overdose. That is directly related to this porous border in which those drugs come across and this kind of lackadaisical viewpoint towards street crime that allows the border to be open, to come across, to be distributed with minimal consequences. We have an alternative vision as to how to address that. Republicans have shown that in the past, and Republicans have done it better. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know what uh, Democrats were thinking when they started this whole process of defund the police. When they said to law enforcement, you're the problem, not the criminals. When they said to people that are committing small crimes to say, you can, we'll just look the other way and consider that you just had a tough upbringing and so we're not going to pay attention to that and assume nothing else happened. I don't know what they expected when they launched out sanctuary cities and said if individuals that are illegally present in the country, if they come to the United States, we're just going to look the other way and allow those individuals to stay in the country even though they commit crime after crime after crime. Literally across the street from this Capitol building is Union Station, where just this week, a person illegally present in the country painted swastikas all over Union Station, but ICE didn't deport them because D.C. is a sanctuary city and they weren't getting turned over. We have a serious problem with just basic law enforcement in this country. That right now this administration is trying to handcuff law enforcement and release criminals. We're doing exactly the wrong thing time after time after time. Individuals that illegally cross our southern border are being released in the country, and federal law enforcement officials are being treated as if they're hotel check-in staff rather than federal law enforcement, and told to just wave people through. We're not getting any criminal history from the countries of origin they're coming from. We literally have no idea if they have a criminal history from where they just came from. We're tracking it once they have a criminal history here, but the enforcement is almost none. And the message now is, if you illegally cross our southern border, when you're waved in, you're given your first hearing in six years. Literally being told, you can stay illegally present in the country for the next six years. And by the way, if you don't show up for that hearing, they're already getting the message, we're not gonna pursue you either. When an administration has a policy of defund the police, when our big cities have district attorneys that are saying we're not going to prosecute, when our president of the United States determines that illegally crossing a border without getting any criminal background check to come into the country from where they're from is acceptable, we're going to watch crime increase. And as the drugs continue to flow across our southern border, people commit more crime to be able to get more drugs, and it accelerates from there. There are ways to be able to address this. We're not asking for something unreasonable. Our families and our communities demand that someone stands up for those victims, not those that are actually causing the harm to the victims. And may I remind everyone, law enforcement have families too. And so while this administration decides to be soft on crime, there are individuals in houses today in my state that are hugging a loved one looking them in the face as they walk out in their uniform and saying, be safe out there, while this administration tends to look the other way. That's backwards, and that's not where America's looking for. Is it any wonder that Americans and Kansans are fearful? Is it any wonder that Americans or Kansans shake their head heads at what they see happening today. We are a country designed to be based upon the rule of law. Our country can only function when people feel safe and secure 
in their homes, in their schools, in their communities, in their churches, their synagogues, when they feel comfortable sending their kids on a bus to receive their education, when they're comfortable walking down the street as a senior citizen. The fact that people cannot be safe, cannot feel safe in America, is no shocking thing when we see what's happening today. One, the conversation about defunding the police. I can assure you that the people who cried out for defunding the police were, would be the, among the first to call the police when they're in a circumstance of danger. I would tell you as the ranking Republican, the former chairman of the Appropriations Committee that funds the Department of Justice's programs in support of law enforcement, we have not defunded the police. In fact, the appropriation bill that's pending increases the funding for local law enforcement, for county sheriff's offices, police departments, by 75 percent. Give them the tools. Give them the resources. Don't defund the police. That's nothing but common sense. We can help them do their jobs, and we can help them do their jobs even better, and we can help them be safer in performing their law enforcement duties. And second, it's no wonder that Americans, Kansans, can't feel safe when they see on the news the circumstance on our borders in which people come at will. The border creates the problem with drugs, and drug, drugs create the problem with crime. And until we stop the flow, until we secure our borders, there's lots of reasons that border security is important, but we will not be safe. You don't have to live on a border to be unsafe in the circumstance we find ourselves in today. You're unsafe in Kansas because of the drugs coming to our state across our borders. It's important. This is uh, an opportunity for all of us to make certain that our law enforcement agencies the men and women who serve our community and nation supporting us, supporting law and order, enforcing the rule of law, we have the opportunity to make certain they have the tools. We also have the opportunity to say, I respect you and I thank you for protecting me and my family. Thank you all for your coverage of this important event. In 2018, I had the opportunity to walk the streets of Indianapolis with a number of concerned citizens and some clergy leadership, leaders of the nonprofit Ten Point Coalition of Indianapolis. This coalition was, was organized years ago to try and prevent violent crime from plaguing the cities of Indianapolis. And I can tell you, it was created because at the time there was grave concern about the number of fatalities on the streets of Indianapolis. In 2018, there were 178 Hoosiers who lost their lives in Indianapolis through homicide. Just three years later, we saw a 52% increase in the number of homicides. 271 individuals, many of them leaving behind children, blessed family members, spouses, murder. It's not just Indianapolis, however, that is less safe. More than a dozen major cities across the United States have seen similar upticks in violent crime. Now, there are indeed all sorts of reasons for this, but we know one of the real drivers has been public policy, a lack of leadership, including here at the federal level. When you have porous borders, and you allow in horrible substances that, that pollute our streets and, and uh, fuel criminal enterprises, you're going to have more murders. When you're unsuccessful in persuading the Chinese Communist Party to cease, cease its export of, of precursors used to produce these horrible banned substances, you're going to have more murders. When you nominate to the Justice Department of the United States of America soft on crime, 
U.S. attorneys and, and top Justice Department officials. You're going to have more murders. And yes, though a number of my Democratic colleagues have recently seen the light as it relates to the defund the police rhetoric, when you plant that seed, folks, you are going to have more murders. So I'm pleading. I'm pleading with this administration to step up, to lead. I'm pleading with my colleagues to stay as strong as possible in supporting our police during these very difficult times. I'm pleading with our community leaders not to lose hope because as you've seen today, there are a number of people that stand with you, that stand with our most marginalized communities, that stand with our men and women in blue to ensure that every American has the benefit of a safe community for their family and for themselves. I'm pleading with, with Americans to tell their United States Senator, to tell their representatives, and, and to tell this administration that if they fail to see the light, we're going to make them feel the heat and change their policies. Republicans won't stand down. We will continue to stand up for safe communities so that every American can realize their full human potential. Thank you. Thank you, guys.